Okay, now we're going to go to the NACTO Urban Bikeway Design Guide. This is already. Well, it's the 15 largest cities, 15 of the largest cities, oops, 15 of the largest cities who got together to affect transportation policy nationally. Then they created a um, affiliate membership specifically for cycling. So that, and it's only like a thousand bucks or something. So it's worth it because it's going to give cities access to behind the scenes where the, the cities that put together the NACTO guide have created a dialogue amongst themselves of what's working and not working and they are leading the shaping of the next version of the NACTO guide. So the reason to spend that thousand dollars as a city is to get in past what you see on the interface into the details where you can really work with the city traffic engineer in Portland, for example, or Chicago and Seattle and San Francisco and uh, the, see the affiliate members are, uh, Indianapolis is an affiliate member, which is cool. They're doing really good stuff there. I think Berkeley, I mean, there's some smaller places that are kind of getting into the, the weeds on the details and working with the engineers. The Cities for Cycling project was created to deal with the, all the if deficiencies in the MUTCD and the AASHTO guide. So, because what's happened is that you've got these documents that are, have some good stuff in them, have given us a really good start in a lot of our cities, but are primarily reflecting a highway engineering approach to transportation rather than an urban situation approach. They're lacking a lot of treatments that are commonly used all throughout the world. Their processes are extremely slow to evolve, like the Na Ashto guide is 1999. Do you know when the next one's coming out? Well, a year is what they're saying. And how long has it been in review? Four years. It was supposed to come out last year, and then a member of the Bicycle Technical Committee that informs the METCD put the thing on hold because he had so many comments. And so they had to go back to the drawing board, issue a new contract, start over. I mean, it was just it's laborious, right? And the production of it will be a guide that's on paper. And the very second that that guide comes out, it will be out of date. And the METCD is a very slow process that you guys know has all this labyrinth of committees and whatnot that control it. And so the idea, so there came a breaking point, and the story's in my book, but there came a breaking point where um, my, myself and the city traffic engineer, Rob Birchfield, Portland, said, you know, this is just not working for cities. It's not working. Let's go create our own sandbox and we'll try to fill in all those gaps. So we called the city of Chicago, San Francisco, Seattle, Minneapolis, Boston, New York, and said, um, would you like to join us in an effort to provide the information on what we've learned about all these treatments that are not in these guides? And they all to a one said, absolutely. What can we do to help? And they all flew to Portland and we launched the Cities for Cycling project and we went to NACTO, the National Association of City Transportation Officials, saying this makes sense because AASHTO is state highway transportation officials, NACTO is city transportation officials. Doesn't it make sense to be affiliated with an organization that's specifically looking at urban issues and in the way that urban practitioners, all of us do, it's complex in urban areas. There's a lot going on. We have a lot of comp com competition. And our goals are different than state highway uh, engineers. You know, the, the goals are different. We're not just trying to zoom cars through communities. We're trying to create communities and create livable, thriving streets. So that's, how we, so that's what we did. We got together and we focused on creating this toolkit. Uh, so it's, right now, it's online for you. And I'll, I'll go to that. Uh, and it's a robust guide that tries to deal with the fact that our, our traditional urban situation is in New York, but a traditional bike lane might get you something like this in New York. Yikes. We're trying to get to walkability at a higher level. We're trying to reach this interested but concerned group that's un uncomfortable riding in a traditional bike lane on major roads. Oh, New York City's got some nice data that they've done that's really similar to Portland's. Ridership up, casualties down. This presentation is online at apbp.org as a PDF. You can download the entire thing. So the idea is we've got cities all throughout the world that use these techniques, colored bike lanes, bike signals, separated bikeways. Have you guys been to Vancouver, BC and seen these yet? Really cool. Dunsmuir and Hornby on their downtown streets, two ways. 
I'll tell you what, the sporty folks are not, do not like those because they're very slow. You have to stop at a lot of light. So it st really changes the mentality of a city. Even uh, cities all throughout South America and abroad and even in China where they went, had the bike as a major mode of transportation, started shifting over towards the car and are trying to bring the bike back. Because they've come to the realization that you simply cannot accommodate a billion people driving everywhere. It's not going to work. Japan, even in Africa, they're starting to use separated bikeways in India. And what they did in Sevilla in the last five years is just mind-blowing. They've taken a very large city and added hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of bike, separated bikeways like this and grew from having less than 1% of people biking to something like 10% just in like five years. It's unbelievable. And it's, of course, not just the international cities. You've got New York and Portland and New York and San Francisco and Chicago and Philadelphia, Washington, D.C. And it's the re simple reality is that it's just better than fabulous. This is the one that's getting so much controversy in New York because the residents here um, are, there's a bunch of really wealthy, it's a, a, the whole po there's a whole political scandal. Okay, I just wanted to say that there's a, the, a bunch of cities that have helped with this. It wasn't just those other cities. Even Houston was super helpful, and Los Angeles and Austin really involved. Our team involved a panel of uh, international practitioners and experts. We had sponsorship. Thank you, Bikes Belong. Thank you, everybody know Bikes Belong. Thank you, Bikes Belong. Appreciate it. And the SRAM Cycling Fund. <laughs> so the cat there's five categories, I should say this. Right now, there's online, when you go up there, you'll see a slideshow. Five categories, traditional bike, I'm just gonna go through what it looks like so you can just see it. And then you guys as engineers and planners should go on and spend more time. But it, uh, here's what's neat, I was in Calgary the other day and they said, what do I do about a bike box? And we just pop this right up on the screen and all the details are up here. So that what you might see is something like, let's go to buffered bike lanes. These are 21 treatments that are not currently in the METCD. The very first thing you're going to see is a slideshow of a bunch of different cities. Now, you're going to notice that New York has a lot of pictures, and that's because New York was a big um, part of this, and New York thinks that they are the center of the universe. <laughs> so anytime we were showing other pictures, they were like, where are the New York pictures? Where are the New York pictures? And, and, uh, and we would say, why did you do things this way? And they'd say, because it's New York. We do what we want to do in New York. You got a problem with that? It's your problem, not my problem. So this is just to give you a sense of the fact that um, often we hear, well, nobody in the U.S. is doing this stuff, so we can't do it. No, the, act the opposite. Lots of people are doing it. They're just all doing it differently. And is, is there a problem with that? Not really, but as more, the more we can get to un uniformity and some sense of logic in the thinking, the better. Should we go to cycle tracks then? You want to know about cycle tracks first? Okay, so there's several kinds of cycle tracks. There's a one-way cycle track raised cycle tracks and two-way cycle tracks, and they have very different issues. One-way cycle tracks are the simplest. Again, the first thing that you're going to see is a photo gallery. So the cycle track, the idea is that it combines the convenience of the bike lane and being on a major road with the separation of an off-street path. It creates a much more safer and comfortable feeling on major roads to have that level of separation. They are not for the faint of heart because you have to treat every intersection really well. There are going to be conflicts at intersections if you don't either separate the movements with signals or deal with every turning movement along the way, including driveways, minor intersections, and major intersections. It was done well. I just wish it was a little longer. It kind of ends at the White House, and then you're, uh, it's a little confusing. But that's a different one, because that's a two-way cycle track in the middle of the road. The simplest level of cycle track is one way on one side of the road where you've really dealt with the intersections and the driveways. But it is, again, it's not for faint of the heart. There's a couple key things. Intersections, how do cyclists take a left turn? That's another challenge. So we talk in there. We have all the intersection issues are under intersections, OK? So they're not under. The, the cycle track section will have everything between the intersections, and then the intersection, every detail on the intersections is dealt with separately, because as you know, as traffic engineers, the intersections are far more complicated, so they're over their intersections. So you've got to deal with the intersections. It also creates a definitive priority 
for b people on bikes in the bike lane over motor vehicle turning movements into driveways in particular. So businesses have to be worked with very carefully. They are getting some pushback in uh, Vancouver, BC because of the challenge of motorists trying to get in and out of driveways and having to cross this. Uh, the cycle, cycle tracks takes priority. Motorists coming out of the driveway of a building or a garage are where are they supposed to wait? In the sidewalk? In the cycle track? They're looking to turn right, they're looking to turn left. It really shifts the prioritization of feeling along the street. So let me tell you the very best place to do a cycle track, the very first one you're doing it, on a street that has no driveways. Try to pick a street that has very minimal conflicts where you can get a nice flow and that's the best place to start rather than a street that's broken up by driveways every 20 feet. That's probably not the best place for a one-way cycle track. Does that make sense? And now let's go through what you would see. First we see a description on what it is. These are at street level and use a variety of methods for physical protection from traffic. We're going to go to raise cycle track for information on raising it, which is another way. We have 3D renderings for each one, which is really cool. So you can get a sense of what they look like from all angles. You can see that the hatched marking, which is permitted in the METCD, is specifically to help with the door zone, as well as to help have a little pedestrian area for pedestrians to be able to walk um, up to the corner to cross. Now, in some cities, they have parking meters along the way, and there's been some challenge with these because of that. Some cities have a parking meter one that they use for the whole block. I can't remember what the name of that is. Maybe that's not an issue around here at all. Some cities have used planters as a way to create a more attractive level of separation. And some have used extruded curbs. So these are some different ways that you could get to the creating the separation. One of the things that is helpful when you're trying to design these is to document your decisions, right? And the, we have put up here a list of studies that relate to every bit of everything that's out there about the one-way cycle track. And so there's more information in lots of places on studies that support and links, if, if they're available, on whatever studies support the assertions that have been made. Types of applications, streets with parking lanes, streets with, on which bike lanes would cause many bicyclists to feel stressed for various factors, streets where you can deal with the conflicts at intersections, streets with high or anticipated high bicycle volume, and specifically notes that we need to have special consideration at transit stops. Engineering fantasy here, really detailed design guidance, set up a lot like the METCD, required, recommended, and optional. And so on every bit of this, you're going to be able to click on any of these details, which is nifty, zoom in, get a reference to where in the METCD this comes from, <coughs> specifically to find the guidance. So you can see that, a lot of tra that we had traffic engineers involved every step of the way in this, that it wasn't just put together by some bike advocates, that this is really a robust document. Are you all agreeing with that? Are all the engineers going, yes, this is helpful? Ah, thank you. It is helpful. <laughs> Fantastic. It's all right there for you. You don't even have to flip through. Do you know how much of work it was to figure out where all this stuff was within the MET city <laughs> and put it together? It's like, yeah, it's like, it's, I mean, you know what that manual looks like. It's ginormous. And, and this stuff is, okay, you got your bike lane sign in that section, but the hatch lines are not in the bike section. So we had to go pick and pick through and find all this. We had um, all these cities in a room several times working together, arguing about how wide the lane should be, how angled the hatching should be, what color should be used. It was fabulous. You would have loved it. It was great. San Francisco arguing with New York, arguing with Portland. And then we did that on conference calls every week for months and months and months. It was just fascinating. Fascinating is there are three types of encouragement activities I found particularly effective to go along with your transportation network changes. One is big events like ciclovias. So maybe at lunch we'll show the ciclovia video. There's a bunch of great videos on street films. And if you haven't experienced a car-free ciclovia event, it's mind-blowing. It's, it's an incredible way to open people's eyes and heart, uh, minds and hearts up to bicycling and walking. And as soon as they end, people flood the city with requests for information and bike route map. They want route maps and they want to keep going. 
And there's two types of ciclovias. There are those that are on major roads, like commercial roads, and there are those that are on neighborhood streets where you might like, 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 like go by parks and schools and, and might be where you're doing your first neighborhood greenway project or want to get people comfortable with the notion that the neighborhood streets are part of the transportation system as well. They both have really good uses. I love that the neighborhood ones bring people out from their houses and experience, it's like a big gigantic community block party. And it's an incredible experience. That's what you experienced, DK, when you were in Portland. And you, you came upon my house where I was giving away hot dogs. Uh, I gave away 600 hot dogs. 600 hot dogs, it was a hot day too. It was, it was really, really fun. And we got to know neighbors that we never knew before. And here's the best thing, my daughter who was eight at the time, uh, sort of disappeared for a while and I forgot to be worried about her. And she had wandered off to go visit with her friends uh, and it was like this moment where you realize our kids don't get enough freedom anymore. And she's gonna be fine because there's no cars out there. She's great, it's totally great. And so it's this incredible moment where everybody has this common experience of going, wow, our public space is our space, we own it. It's not, doesn't belong to those metal boxes that we park and drive around. Um, so I really encourage you to do a ciclovia, small, large, I mean, it can be a one mile segment, it can be a 15 mile segment, it can be a loop, it can be a back and forth. There's no shortage of ways to do it. It's a very low cost. The healthcare community has been a huge sponsor of these events. So you can do these for very low cost if, if our friends at Kaiser would just sponsor them all. Or, I'm sorry, are you from a competing agent? Uh, I'm at the university. University, okay. <laughs> second, second type of um, really effective encouragement activity is the Safe Routes to School program. And that's creating the whole next generation that's gonna, be, that's gonna think the bicycle is just normal. And it needs to be a part and parcel of school education, not just an after school program that that all kids touch and feel and get on bikes as part of their educational activity. You see this in Europe, again, very common. Uh, and so continue on in your works to bring it to the schools and make it part of, uh, of everyday education. And the third area is the Smart Trips type of program. And I know Fort Collins had one for a while. It's individualized marketing. So the notion is for 100 years, we have been blasting ourselves with information about driving. From our physical infrastructure to our advertising, to our information, to every cue that we send. And it's gonna take more than just putting out the bike lanes to get people out riding. We have to combat it on a one-on-one -on -one with that information gap. What's the phrase that Linda said when you were meeting with her? Did, you, did she give you a phrase that she uses for this? No, I'm, I was thinking of something else, okay. So anyway, there's this information gap. And so what we do is we take a swath of a city, and we've done this in small cities with just a few hundred people, and in large cities with 20,000 people at a time. Send to every household a survey. Can you just pop up the presentation that has this? It's called ACT, A-C-T, Jessica Roberts. The first one on the left. I just wanna make that, yeah. I'll do this in five minutes. So we send to every household, first of all, these are the principles of the, sur of the program. It's an opt-in program. Information plus a habit, the habit of driving is a barrier. So we're trying to lower the barrier to entry by giving customized information that meets people really where they want. We're talking about discretionary home-based trips. So could be a trip to the grocery store, restaurant, doesn't have to be the work trip. Frequent co responsive contact. It's friendly, positive, and encouraging. The staff are amazing. You've got to have the right outreach staff for this. High design of qu a quality, and it's a limited sort of focus targeted type of campaign. The places to go are there's sort of key areas of town that really make sense. Again, go with the low hanging fruit. This is kind of a phasing thing. There's a lot of work behind the scenes to make it happen. We put together all these nice maps and, and brochures and stuff. Then we send to every household a survey. And the survey says, what would you like information about? Would you like a map? Would you like transit tickets? Would you like a bus uh, schedule? Would you like um, a helmet? You know, whatever it is that you need, you can check off on this form. And then within 48 hours, sometimes a week, somebody delivers to your home the information that you asked for. These are all some examples of different things. We talk for a minute about the maps, okay? Instead of just sending like a traditional bike commute map, which is, we try to make it much more family friendly. 
and have on it all kinds of things, parks, stores, bike shops, schools, really bring it down to the level that a kid could read this. This is an example of a project where my company does a lot of these programs all around the country. This is in Sausalito. This is our warehouse where we store all the stuff. Uh, we have a yeah. newsletter and we have stuff online and you get to order all this stuff and this is what the form looks like. We expect, expect something like an 8 to 20% return for the survey. Really good response for these surveys. People like getting free stuff. We deliver it by bike within, you know, hopefully 48 hours. So people really connect. Okay, these people are serious. They're going to give me this stuff. And then for the next four to six weeks, we blitz the neighborhood with fun, exciting activities uh, that get them really motivated to bike and walk. So it could be women on bikes rides and clinics, kids rodeos, senior strolls community fairs and festivals. We go out to where people are, at the farmer's markets and at the churches, and we go to them with all this information all throughout the given month so that everybody touches this program within this, whatever boundary you're in, everybody touches this program at least three or four times. And the guided bike, the walks and the rides are so critical, particularly when you're opening up a new neighborhood greenway or facility. Evaluation has been, we've already, I can just tell you the answer, which is that if you do it right, 9 to 13 percent of drive alone trips shift over to other modes. We have found this in just about every community we've worked in. Particularly, you get the higher return where your infrastructure is good. If your bike and walk infrastructure is not that good, you're not going to get as much of a shift in mode share. Does that make sense? It's like trying to sell a product that you don't have. I had one community that tried to hire us, and they're in North Carolina to get more people to, to bike and walk and take transit. And they're trying to encourage people to take transit where there's basically two buses a day and no sidewalks to stand on. We didn't get a great return on that one. We just didn't. But in places where you have a great bike infrastructure, what I found is amazing in Portland, in my neighborhood, we already have a very high bike mode share. That's the one that had 29% for at, at least occasional use. And we thought people won't, we probably won't get a lot more people biking in this neighborhood. We'll probably get more people taking the bus or walking. It was the opposite. It, the biking, it was just the tipping point. We just had to get in there and do this program, and that pushed it up significantly to the next level. The cost is about $20 a household. 9 to 13% shift of drive alone trips over to biking, walking, or transit. A lot of it, we do a lot of, the, we, the reason we know this is we do a lot of pre and post travel diary kind of work where we ask people, how, did, how do you get around for all your trips beforehand, and then track all your trips during uh, the period after? We've done some after evaluation a couple years later. We find it does stick. So that's good news. It's good stick. Uh, all this information is, there's a lot of information online at Portland's Smart Trips program. So you can find all that. And then there's been some APBP webinars on it as well. And there's a bunch of different examples that we've got from communities around the country that we can share with you. Uh, the program looks a little bit labor intensive. Yes, tax it is labor intensive. Is We have always used paid staff, and what we've done is um, we've, uh, the funding for these programs has been, a comp some of them have been grant funded, some of them have been sponsored by healthcare organizations or other sponsors, and we've paid staff because we really wanted to have a high level of professional quality so that the pe person showing up with your tote bag looks nice and is able to answer questions and is really versed in the program. But it's seasonal work, so we have about four months of that intensive staff time. And the city of Portland's been trying to figure out how they can keep those people working the rest of the year. But traditionally, it's been a seasonal kind of, of work. And we've hired people and trained them. And, and so, so the funding for the labor then comes from? From the, from the grant or whatever. And that's really the two costs are labor and the printed materials. Right. That's pretty much it. OK, so those are the three programs that are particularly effective. Big events, iconic, car-free experiences. Smart trips programs with a particular focus on women and children, and safe routes to school. So if you do those three things and you really institutionalize that into your government structure, ex embrace that as part of the role, partner with the community groups, partner with the health healthcare institutions, then this will uh, greatly enhance the engineering work that you do to change the infrastructure. OK, DK, I did that in five minutes. Now can you put up the one that says? Um, IBPI data collection. This one has 168 slides, so I don't think we're going to get through it. <laughs> Not that one. The next one. That one. 
Because we've already talked about data to a certain extent, so I'm, I'm not, I'm tr we'll try not to overdo it. Thank you. I have done a lot of workshops on data collection. As you can tell, I'm kind of a data geek, even though I'm not an engineer. But I like data. I like it for a lot of reasons. I like it because it helps tell us if we're achieving our goals. I like it because we can collect baseline data for future projects and really be able to see what we've done. You know, have we really shifted mode share? Have we affected traffic? Um, have we affected crashes? You know, I like to be able to sort of prove that what we're, our, that our, what we're doing is not just faith, that it's real. I like it because over time we're going to be able to use this data to truly adjust our traffic models and our assumptions. Um, we won't have to rely on, a, a, on land use models that project future traffic based on a suburban sprawl way of thinking. That instead we can make adjustments within the models to look at different scenarios. I like it because it helps us be able to tell our story. You'll see in my book uh, that a lot of these stories I told you, there are nuggets of data all throughout. So, uh, and I really labored hard to take those nuggets of data and kind of write something fun and compelling around the data. But the data is what, uh, the, the stories are what people resonate. The reason I wrote the book is because I've been teaching at Portland State University since 2002. And, my, and I would give all this technical stuff about, here's what's in the toolkit, and here's how we can do bike parking, and blah, blah, blah. You know, all the technical kind of overview stuff. And, but I would tell stories in each one about these battles that we fought, or the people, and the struggles. And I would use a little bit of weave-in data. And afterwards, um, my students, that's what they said they resonated with. They came up and they said, guys, that story is the one that made me want to focus my career on biking and walking. Or politicians, you know, I had a, I had a workshop that I did with, uh, that Earl Blumenauer hosted, and Nancy Pelosi, the former Speaker of the House, was there. And I had, I was called upon. And I had, you know, when you've got the Speaker of the House, you've got like two minutes to say something relevant. You better say something relevant. So I told this story about this kid at our school, Cyrus, who was really overweight, and he had, and that was, in part because he had a serious developmental disability that caused him to be extremely emotional, vo emotionally volatile, and so he was on all this medication. And the medication had side effects, which was that weight gain. And he had also developed within that kind of a sedentary lifestyle. And he won a bike in our Safe Routes to School program at school, and he told his dad, we are biking to school from here on out. And they started biking, and he his emotions leveled out, like everybody noticed it immediately, the, his teachers and the family and the whole, you know, when you have a kid that's uh, emotionally volatile, it's devastating for the whole family. It's very hard. And so their family had been ripped apart. The parents had gotten divorced and they had three kids and it was really, really hard. And when he started biking and his moods evened out, the whole family life mellowed out, like everybody was able to get along better, the teachers were able to see progress. and. Jim, his dad, came up to me at our, one of our Safe Routes to School events and he said, bicycling saved our lives. So I told this to Nancy Pelosi and she apparently talked, has talked about this story ever since. Because I've heard this all across the country. People, oh, you're the one, Nancy Pelosi's talked about you. And she sent me a personal note when she got a copy of my book. Actually, I don't think it was truly personal. I think an aide wrote it, but it looked personal. <laughs> it looked personal. So I like telling the stories, but I like the data to back it up so it doesn't sound like I'm just making stuff up. Okay, and uh, the modeling is another area where you guys all understand traffic models, we, what we use them for and everything, and the biggest problem being that it's based on data in the past. Thousands and thousands and thousands of points of data in the ITE Trip Generation Manual that have given us uh, our traffic models today. And we don't have thousands of points of data on biking and walking. Uh, so that's why I am so insistent that we continue to collect this data so that we can build a future where we can do this model. And we need to be taken seriously. Let's face it, a lot of times there's a tremendous amount of skepticism that what we're trying to do is really going to happen. I mean, I can't tell you how many, how many stories you'll see them in the book where there's a skepticism. What? You're not, there's no way there's going to be thousands of people biking in that corridor. We can't afford that. You know, there's only two people biking today, so therefore there will never be any people biking in the future. Well, maybe there's only two people biking today because there's, no crummy, you know, there's a crummy bike lane or there's no bike lane at all and that if we put in the facility, it'll induce demand in that direction. Well, so the next thing is they're gonna say is prove it. Where's the model that shows that? And I like to have fancy models, because <laughs> let's face it, Greek letters are very impressive. 
but the reality, lack of empirical data and problems with all these various models. So we've talked about counts, so that's one cr really simple and low cost thing to do. Build it into your data collection program, try to do it every year, build a trend line over time as opposed to just one point of data, multiple points of data. I love it if you guys did it at the regional level. Fantastic, Portland's regional government has three years of data now off the National Bicycle and Pedestrian Documentation Project's sort of methodology at all around the region and we're working on a study for them now trying to extract from the data, evaluate and learn. What can we learn? How much did the completeness of the bikeway network around a point influence the usage? How much is a bike lane different than a trail? How much is the, bike, the trail uh, in terms of gender? How can we look at helmet use patterns? So there's all kinds of stuff we can extract from the data once we've got it. And we've talked a little bit about surveys. So there's the kind of survey where you can do the census as a survey. It's asking people, how did you get to work today? That's one, it's one point of data. There's a type of survey where you can ask people, um, so what did you do? That's a behavior survey of what did you do, past behavior. Or you can do a predictive behavior survey would you do this if? I will caution you that predictive surveys are not very reliable. Grab, grab your copy of the book before you go. Thank you for coming. If you have to leave, grab your copy of the book. Uh, predictive surveys are notoriously, well, they're not accurate. They're really meant to um, help justify something or help make a decision. So if you say, would you bike if there were more trails put in, most people are going to say yes. Sure, I will. And okay, that's useful. But if you were going to say, would you use this versus this, maybe you could get something. But it's hard for people to know what they're going to do. So it's a little bit risky to use sort of predictive surveys. But you can. A wonderful kind of survey is to say, how is this facility working for you? Uh, Copenhagen, their measure of success is 80% of the population is happy with their bikeway facilities. Feels good. That's one of their key measures of success. Not just the usage, but how do people feel about it? Do they feel safe? Do they feel comfortable? Safe and comfortable, those are the two things. And they ask people, do you feel safe? Do you feel comfortable? And they gauge that every year on certain corridors. So gauging the, the performance of a facility can be useful. And then another type of survey is really just to gain super meaningful input, like when we're doing a bike plan. And I use a lot of survey work in that case to really get people into the details. Where do you want to go? What types of trips do you already do or might do if we did this or that? Who in your family bikes? For what distances? might you bike? What kind of biking do you do now? Is it mostly sporty? Is it um, transportation? So, uh, and we do uh, lots of surveys like that. And here's sort of a sample of different kinds of surveys. You know, I will just leave this presentation with DK, so any of you that are really interested in all the details of different kinds of surveys and how to use them uh, can get into the details. But kind of the key thing to note is that surveys, the words in the surveys are super critical to get them right, because you can ask the same question in totally different ways and get a completely different response. Now we talked about the census, talked about these. I want to talk about travel diaries. Do you, have you used travel diaries, you MPOs, for cities? Travel diary surveys? Yeah. Okay. So you guys all know about travel diaries. So it's a much better way than just the census to really gauge behavior, right? Travel diary surveys, okay, got that. The Smart Trips program, pre and post evaluation, the most expensive kind is the travel diary surveys. There's other types of cities have wanted to spend less money, so they've used a web-based survey or they've used a you know, shorter phone survey, that kind of thing. We, this is some of the data that we got out of the Smart Trips survey, is that uh, some of the results for over a three-year period for about six different target areas gave us this kind of data. Workplace results, increase in environmentally mode, uh, friendly mode, and a decrease in drive alone. Uh, I'm not fond of telephone surveys these days. Why? Nobody answers the phone. Very, very expensive to get a representative sample. These pollsters that are telling, you know, advising politicians that are using phone surveys, very sketchy methods, very sketchy. So be careful about that. Uh, the mail is more accurate, but very hard to get a good response. However, the smart trips, we get a good response. And the web-based surveys are uh, very quick and cheap and are only going to get the people that are willing to sign up for the web-based survey, right? So you have to think through, maybe there's some different pieces of the puzzle. I, I try to step back and go, what information do I want to get? What methods are going to get me to that information? 
Am I really needing solid data or do I just need to tell a story? Do I just need to create an impression in the public's mind? So for example, the city of Portland uh, noticed that there were a lot of bike related businesses. Now you guys have cat eye and all kinds of businesses around here, but Portland isn't, you know, we, we have a lot of little bike shops and we had seemed to have more bike companies moving to Portland. So they contacted me and they, they contacted me and they said, could you find out for us? What does this look like? Do we have a bike business sector? How much is that worth? How many jobs is that? So I designed a, a, a survey that had four questions. How much revenue, what's your revenue annually? How many employees do you have? Has um, the Portland's bike friendly reputation helped your business? And the, really three questions, that was pretty much it. And then does the city, uh, if you have any comments. And we basically used and called every business owner personally and kind of played off our reputation to say, hi, I really need you to take like five minutes to answer these questions. And we got a fantastic response. So the whole thing I was able to do in about $5,000 worth of time and came up with this number that $100 million worth of local economic activity is specifically related to bikes. Direct, not health benefits, not reduced congestion or pollution, just direct dollars in the economy. And that that was about 1,500 jobs. So for $5,000, the city got this point of data that went immediately exploded. It went to the New York Times. It was in the Wall Street Journal. It was on every television show. Uh, Earl Blumenauer has used this constantly. As a result of that, the Economic Development Agency of Portland invested $100,000 in helping small businesses in the bike sector uh, get training, get small business loans, help them talk to each other. They kind of created a working group where they talked to each other. Ask them, what can we do to help you facilitate your business growth? And so we haven't done the study in a couple years, but I can tell you that it's probably exploded since then. And just that little investment in that survey really opened up a whole door that the business community was simply unaware of. And our leadership was simply not really clued into until we did that little survey. So and in that case, we did not need it to be like scientifically valid. We just needed the information. Now, there was one piece of it that was scientifically valid, which was they wanted to know uh, the tourism benefit. And I looked at the Colorado study that's on the tourism benefits of bicycling in Colorado. Wisconsin has a similar study. So I designed a similar study. And we counted all the rides, races, events, and tours that happened in Portland in a year, 4,000, about 11 a day. And then we tried to do that calculation of how much do people spend on these rides when they're visiting or going on the rides. And the media came down hard on that number, okay? They said, that you just made that up. Where'd you come up with that? And here's the good news. All I had to do was hand them the list. Here's the list. I got it, off, I got it from all these groups. Feel free to check my list. And that's it. All the controversy went away. And ever since then, the media quotes that Portland has 4,000 bike-related events, tours, and, and races a year. So I say this. You don't need to spend a ton of money to collect data and use it in a compelling way but you do need to do something. And it needs to be at the level of stepping back and going, what do we need to prove? Or what do we need to know? And then think through carefully how to design that study, that research to back you up. The universities I use constantly. I use Portland State University constantly. And in all the cities that I work, I partner with universities to have students administer surveys. Uh, anywhere I work, we, we hire students and train them and work with classes, sometimes sociology professors, sometimes statistics, sometimes planning, sometimes engineering. I mean, they love projects like this. So definitely partnering with universities is a wonderful thing to do. Um, I could spend a lot of time talking about safe routes to school data. It's kind of a synthesis of all of this. But I think the key thing is the, com the combination of actual counts, some kind of probing survey work, and an annual report. So that's kind of the final point I want to leave you with is document what you're doing and report back to your city council or your leadership group every year. Make this part of what you do. We have some really great examples that I can send you. San Francisco's got an annual report card that they do, and Portland has an annual report that they do, and there's a bunch, and Copenhagen has the bicycle account, they call it, that they do. Chicago has a similar report. Boulder, do you have a similar report? We did a, uh, no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we did a, year perspective um, and we want to really do minor updates to it annually with probably you know the bigger picture every five years. 
Okay, which is another, that, right, exactly. So basically she sets up the methodology. And so you know what your data inputs are, and then every five years do a big update and do some minor updates in the intervening years. You know, fantastic, but she's reporting back. You know, she's thinking through what do we want to know and how are we making sure that we're meeting our targets. And if, you if the MPO can lead that, that's uh, even, even better if the MPO can, or uh, partner with the cities to make sure that everybody's kind of on the same wavelength on the ways that you do this. I think I'll leave with that because we're right at about lunchtime. And I think that's a good way to end. <laughs>